So I'm Peter Stoner and this presentation is about my life in cars or cars in my life. Um, I've been interested in cars for as long as I can remember, which is rather strange because my parents never had a car and an aunt and uncle who brought me up into my teens never had a car either. Uh, my first uh, taste of, of a family member with a car was my eldest brother who was nearly eight years, nine years older than me, and he had a Lambretta motor scooter and eventually got fed up with getting wet on that and bought a really old little standard 10 saloon. And I, I saw this as being just perfection. Um, he went straight into the RAF, the Royal Air Force, as a pilot, as a commissioned pilot, and thought he should have the, the wheels to go with that sort of lifestyle and he bought himself a Bentley four and a quarter litre saloon. Well, I just thought that was just the very best of things. And so by the age of 16, I'd already determined that motoring was going to be very much part of my life. At uh, 16, I already had started to drive, uh, of course not legally because you had to be 17, but my next door neighbour, uh, an older gentleman, uh, who, who had drove lorries, had a little car and he, he used to let me drive it around the local streets and a friend at college used to let me drive home from Sunderland in his little Morris van. Uh, and so by the time I was 16 going on 17, I was always a reasonably accomplished driver. <coughs> and uh, I then, I was doing work in the evenings selling petrol at a local, local petrol station. Um, uh, as you used to do in those days, there was no self-service, you had to have a, somebody from a kiosk serve you. So I used to do my homework from school and so forth. So eventually I amassed a small fortune of £25 and uh, heard about uh, a little MG sports car that was going to be for sale uh, through a friend of a friend. And uh, it was for £50 and I borrowed £25 from my brother to make up the £50 and I bought that. So at 16 there I was with an old MG car, sports car. Uh, and not old enough to put it on the road. So you can guess that by the time my 17th birthday came round, then I was uh, just champing at the bit and I think two weeks into my first 17th year, um, I passed my test. Um, so by this stage, I was uh, then uh, started college life, uh, still serving petrol at the, the garage, um, but able to then run backwards and forwards to college in this really old battered MG sports car. Uh, and it went on from that. We had a fairly active motor, motoring club at the at uh, Sunderland Technical College, which is where I went to, who ra organised little, little rallies and things like this. And I soon got involved in that little organisation, uh, setting out little rallies and competing with them, uh, rallying with friends at reading maps and things like this. Uh, and so I was really, really started to become more interested in competition work with cars. Uh, obviously, I had no money to speak of, but friends of mine, older than friends of mine, uh, were members of a motor club in Newcastle on the, t on the side of the River Tyne, Northumbria Motor Club, and so they used to pick me up and used to go once, twice a week to this motor club. And again, water sport was very much to the fore, and uh, through time and uh, working at the garage, I was then able to buy my second car, which was a battered old Austin Healey, what's it called, Austin Healey 104. Uh, which I think it had been an insurance write-off, but nevertheless gave me the tool to start doing a little bit of uh, more serious competition work. And so I competed in quite a number of driving tests that were called um, little uh, car rallies, overnight car rallies, um, until the point where I was, felt I was really ready for trying in my hand at racing. The garage I worked at had been, had been sold to a young man who was originally from the northeast. This was all happening in the northeast of England. Uh, originally from the northeast, but he'd moved down to London. And actually, his girlfriend was uh, a, a, a hairdresser with Vidal Sassoon, the famous hairdresser. Anyway, so she was making plenty of money. And so this guy bought the garage and immediately uh, started to. Uh, uh, put together this idea of racing a car for himself and bought this what's called an Austin A40 Farina which had a big engine in it and he started racing that and after my work at the pumps or while if it weren't busy I used to go in the garage and work with him on this racing car and eventually he said to me one day listen you know for all the good work you put in why don't we enter you into a race 
And uh, so I had my first ever race at a race circuit in Yorkshire, an old RAF station called Ruffeth. And there I was having my first ever race uh, in his Austin A40, which, very, which was very quick. It would do 130 miles an hour at the end of a long straight. Uh, and so that really got me going um, in terms of competition motoring. However, um, by then I'd got my uh, exams and got a degree in civil engineering and uh, the work that I got took me away from home uh, and in fact uh, took me away to Scotland. And uh, from that point onwards, um, my friends, of course, I, I made new friends up there, but in real terms, um, uh, the Scottish motor racing scene wasn't terribly active in terms of race circuits, but they loved racing up speed hill climbs. So I started to do a bit of that uh, and then bought uh, an Austin, another Austin Healey, this time an Austin Healey 3000, um, from a good friend of mine in Motherwell, Scotland. And uh, between us, we modified it and we were able to compete in hill climbs and occasionally go south to take part in races at the newly opened Croft Circuit in Darlington, County Durham, and one or two others as well. Um, that grew to an even greater interest in racing. Um, the Austin Healey was my everyday road car as well, of course. So I'd turn up at the meeting, inflate the tyres, paint numbers on with whiting for your, your, for your tennis shoes. And after the race meeting, take the pressure down, wipe those off and go home. Other people were turning up with their cars on trailers and things. But um, anyway, I decided that uh, I was uh, good enough to be world champion, Formula One driver, and so needed the accoutrements to go with that. And then we saw uh, a car for sale in Glasgow, uh, a garage owned by two brothers uh, who were quite famous in the area, certainly in Scotland, but also south of the border in terms of promoting racing, lo uh, Lotus uh, racing cars. And they used to get some well-known drivers to drive their cars for them. Anyway, I saw uh, a car called a Janetta G4 which was a kit car really, but a very posh one, a very smart one, and somebody had bought that, it was a competition version, and uh, they were selling it, so I conjured up enough money to buy that. And so that then made it uh, a much more serious venture than previous in racing. So I campaigned that around both the speed hill climbs and then I'd come south of the border um, to uh, race circuits, and I raced at, uh, at Snetterton, at Alton Park, at Croft, of course. Um, I ventured as far as Brands Hatch on one occasion um, and, uh, and, and continued on with that. Um, so I particularly want to move on. The point of this, uh, this presentation is really to talk through the present classic car collection that I have now um, and the part they played in my life. Um, in 1983, I had uh, left my employment and decided to start a company of my own. Uh, I had two young children, but uh, uh, my wife obviously, and uh, living in Bedfordshire. Um, and then the, for the next few years, working and building up my own business took precedence over any further uh, ideas I had with regards to uh, uh, competitions and competition cars and classic cars. Uh, however, um, in, during the early years of, uh, of having my own company, I did build up a little MG sports car, an MG midget, from a car that had been written off on the M1 motorway nearby, uh, and built that up with the help of a friend into a nice little car that I could, uh, we could trot around with uh, uh, at the time. Uh, however, the real breakthrough for me came in, uh, in 1987, when looking out the window of my office to the garage across the way, in their compound, I saw a Porsche. Um, it had the appearance of being a Porsche 911, but um, at the same time, Porsche were making two, a cheap version with a four-cylinder engine and then one with a six-cylinder engine. Um, and so I didn't know which it was and decided it was looking a bit sad for itself uh, and obviously hadn't been used for a long time, so I decided to ask about this car. So the garage, even though I knew the owners, they warned me off at this car. They said this car belonged to one of their customers, the customers wanting to get rid of the car and they had their own ideas on, on what they were going to do with this car. 
um, I knew what, what that meant was they were going to try and get it as cheap as they can and make as much money out of it as they can. Um, and then I, I started asking about locally about this car and the man who actually owned it. And eventually, um, within two days, I knew who the owner was. He ran a car hire business in nearby Newport Pagnell. I didn't know him, um, but I got his name, found his telephone number and rang him. Um, he was a very pleasant guy and said the Porsche uh, had belonged to his son. It was a project because it, this is a car that had been abandoned in an underground car park in London. Uh, no, he didn't say what the reason was for. His son discovered it in that underground car park, but you can't, of course, just claim ownership. You have to advertise in, in, a, in a national newspaper um, to see if there's anybody makes claim on it. And by the time, I think it was for five years, and when the five years are up, um, by then the car had deteriorated in as much as the engine had seized, and it was no longer a project the, this, lad, this chap's son wanted to continue with. So he was interested in selling it. Um, he, he was actually a pretty, pretty turned on sort of guy. He knew the garage, you were trying to get it on the cheap, and he said to me, um, if you can have £4,500 to me tomorrow, uh, you can have the car. Uh, it posed a bit of a question, a bit of a problem for me, because I didn't have £4,500 in ready cash for him. Um, and nor did I really know the details of the car, because they still wouldn't let me in to have a look at it. However, uh, with the help of my mother-in-law, um, she managed to l lend me some money, which I can assure you she got back, um, but uh, sufficient so that I spent this £4,500 and bought this Porsche. And it was with great joy that I went across to the garage and said, you've got to let me have this car because I now own it. Uh, the car was, a, it's, a, it's a, a 1967 Porsche 911. Uh, right-hand drive, um, but the engine was seized um, and it needed some work done on it, uh, particularly the colour had faded where it had been in under a, sort of a sheet in this underground garage. Anyway, with the help of a wonderful friend of mine called Gary Tingey, who had an engineering shop in a garage, we eventually got this car going and I became the proud owner of uh, this beautiful car. And that started really what we're going to talk about, which is the, the, the rest of the cars in the collection. But we might as well start with that. So 1967 Porsche 911. And um, very quickly after I got it, I was enjoying it. I was even using it for trips for work. But really, I wanted to get back to my first love, which was competition motoring. And I'd heard about a car rally that was being run by a very famous ex-rally man, John Brown. Um, which was called Le Jog, which is L-E, Land's End, J-O-G, John of Groats. It wasn't your average uh, run from, from Land's End to John of Groats. This one was three and a half to four days, involved only one night's rest. Um, and in the meantime, you were going doing various tests and trials in, uh, in, uh, in forests. Uh, and in um, army uh, tank test tracks and things like this. Um, so I actually asked a friend, my ex-business partner, if he'd like to navigate for me, and we ended our first competition, which was this, which was to prove and which is known to be an extremely difficult event. Um, so I went on to do six Le Jog rallies, and with this car we won some, uh, we'd had modest success. We got a couple of silver medals and a, and a bronze medal. Um, um, but, uh, of course, all the time my appetite was being whetted. I was doing lots of one-day events and things, and eventually I decided the car wasn't quick enough, so we had to actually get modifications done for it. And so the car benefits from an engine and gearbox that were being built by the most well-known Porsche expert in this country, Andy, Andy Prill, and it became a much more powerful thing altogether. And with that car, um, I, the, uh, I did, I've done probably something like between 75 and 80 different uh, events. Um, and so, uh, the, of course, it, it, I only could do it at, uh, at times when I was, uh, had uh, uh, free freedom from work because obviously the, being self-employed, it was a, 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 a civil engineering, especially a civil engineering company, that was keeping me busy most of the time. 
But as time went on anyway, things got better for me and as, you, as they do, we, the company became, uh, became successful. And at that stage I found, decided that I would start building up a car collection that, that cars that I would really like, but cars that might reflect sections of my life. And they're the ones I'm going to talk to you about. So I'm going to tell you about this car collection and I'm going to start with the oldest car and work to the, 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 the latest uh, in years. Uh, so um, I decided that I wanted a car that was representative of my early motoring years and what better than to buy an MG um, similar to the original car I had. The original car was a 1932 MG J2 with an old Ford L engine, side valve engine in it and it was uh, bastardized with uh, four mica dashboards and things like this but for me it was wheels and that was all that was important. So anyway, I, to represent that I didn't buy another J2, I bought an MGTA. It's a car, it's a 1936 car um, it's been, it was uh, fully restored before I bought it uh, by a gentleman in Dublin in Southern Ireland. It's got books uh, of, of invoices and, and letters uh, giving the full history of, uh, of the car, its car's life, so I know everybody who owned it and uh, the work that's been done to it. Uh, I paid good market price for that car and uh, of course the funny side is, I suppose, is I put a Ferrari in part exchange for it. The Ferrari came into my life because my son and I bought this rather brash looking Ferrari uh, 360 Modena from him. It wasn't me um, and uh, with, before, before long um, I saw the MG that I wanted and the garage uh, then sold the Ferrari for me and gave me the capital to buy the, the, the MG. The MG is, as I say, has been expensively restored. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, but very early on, I decided that really it, it wasn't ideal to be driving around the countryside in anticipation of an accident. Uh, the brakes might have been good for 1936, but they certainly weren't good for now, for 2023. And so I've had some little modifications turned to the brakes. Also, it had no direction indicators, so I've had direction indicators fitted. Uh, but very, very discreetly, and I don't think anybody would be, and even the purists would be upset about that. Um, very early on, uh, Marie, my long-suffering partner Marie, um, decided that uh, as much as she loved the MG, um, she, she thought every time she got in it she was part of an Agatha Christie um, novel. Um, and so she uh, decided that we had to have a name for her. So she's called Betsy, and every time Marie gets in it, she wants to change her name um, to an Agatha Christie character and, uh, and, and off we go. Now the MG 50 miles an hour feels like um, you're attempting the world land speed record. Everything's flapping and banging and rattling but it is a lovely little thing that we enjoy going out for uh, picnics and we go out to, to country pubs on the weekend to have lunch or, or whatever and it's ideal for that and it gets a lot of attention from people because of that. Uh, so that's my first one. Of course that then uh, takes into consideration those early years uh, struggling along with that old MGJ2 and so but so every time I look at this MG, I, it reminds me of those days uh, it's really, so it, it's really really ideal. When I was a young man and um, uh, in 16, although I was driving cars, I, of course I wasn't legally allowed. Um, and so to find, uh, uh, find my way around the country, uh, my best friend uh, at the time, Trevor Ridley, had bought himself a motorbike and sidecar, which is effectively for hunting down babes, but um, effect it did mean that we could travel around with me in this little single-seater sidecar and Trevor riding the motorbike. Anyway, Trevor was rather keen on motorbike racing, so we ventured down as far as from from the northeast. We ventured down as far as Scarborough to watch the the motorcycle race there, and then I persuaded him to start looking at uh, some motor racing uh, in uh, uh, with cars, um, which are in the borders of, uh, of with Northumberland and Scotland. So we went to to uh, old airfields that were made out as race tracks with straw bales and things. Uh, and we enjoyed some wonderful times up there seeing these cars race. 
Now, one of the things that the car, the car that really took my fancy in those days was a beautiful, sleek little car called a Lotus Elite. And there was two or three guys were racing them at that time and they would appear at all these meetings and have, and have a hell of a dust up with these Lotus Elites. And I always thought at one stage in my life, I'm going to get one of those cars. So I left it a long time, but nevertheless, four years ago, um, I decided that I had to have one. Um, I looked around for one that didn't need very much work on it, but uh, and eventually ended up buying uh, my present car, which was actually uh, Mark II uh, Lotus Elite with the much better Bristol body, as they call it. And um, uh, it, uh, it was for sale with a, a, a leading Lotus um, dealership in Birmingham. Um, when I went to see it, it looked fine. It's Pimrose with a silver roof. It's got a very modified engine and a German gearbox, LF gearbox, so um, it's top spec. Um, but the advert said that it needed some, t they said it ran like a Swiss wa Swish watch, but it needed some TLC for the interior, which didn't frighten me. So my, me and my friend went across to have a look at it. There was snow on the ground in the November. We couldn't take it for a test run, but it was started up in the showroom and it sounded great. So we, I bought it on the spot. And, uh, and got a friend of mine, another friend, to go over with his transporter and pick it up for me. Uh, we got it back to where I keep the cars uh, and found immediately that it was a nightmare. Uh, the car wouldn't start. When we did get it to start, uh, it popped and banged. There was loose wires around that. Uh, it, it, was, it was more than we'd reckoned on. Um, and so we then decided and having a good look round, and although I'd paid good money for it, I decided uh, before I committed it to the road that I would get some work done to it. And uh, so we ended up taking the engine gearbox out, everything out in fact. I had the, uh, the Primrose uh, paintwork redone by a friend of mine, did really well. It's, it's all glass fibre of course, the car, so it, it's a special sort of uh, paint and things they use, process. Uh, so we did that. We had some little bits of work done to the engine, a few oil, seal, oil leaks and new seals and bits and pieces. And then I had the seats sent away to uh, um, an upholster, a very well-known upholster up in North Yorkshire, who made a wonderful job with new grey leather on the seats. And eventually I had it re-carpeted re um, and other bits and pieces done. Uh, immediately obvious that this car was still in race trim. And it was so difficult to manoeuvre around town, nothing below 3,000 RPM. It was a bit of an embarrassment really, but by Jove, once it hit 3,000 RPM, everything went really well. Small car, as you know, lots of lead, uh, small 12, 12, 20 Coventry Climax engine in full race trim. In the end, anyway, it was just, it was embarrassing and it was hard on the car uh, for the work I wanted it to do by being in full race tune, so I had it detuned. Um, by a well-known character, David Bogg, on his, and on his rolling road, he managed to get 87 brake horsepower at the wheels from this tiny little car, um, which made for, a, considering it's lightweight, made for a, a real uh, quick package. Um, now it's much more manageable. It's still not manageable enough, but it's manageable um, for what I want, for what I wanted to do. So I fulfilled a dream in having the Lotus Elite that I'd yearned for all those years ago um, and uh, so I'm really proud of that. Well, moving on to third car in the collection, I had to have an Austin Healey again. Um, I had had three uh, Austin Healeys in total, the old Austin 104 then the 3000 that I raised and then I, uh, going back some years, I decided to build up um, an Austin Healey and I, I used that but I uh, it was stuck away in my garage for a long time and eventually someone offered me good money for it and I sold it and I immediately regretted selling it. Um, and so moving on when I started to get a bit more time for myself and had a bit more capital to expendable capital I decided I had to have an Austin Healey and the nearest place to find one is from where I live now in, in East Yorkshire, Beverly East Yorkshire, was to go to Scarborough. Um, there's a specialist in Scarborough who imports Austin Healey's uh, uh, at any one time. There'd probably be 20 or 30 of the cars on his premises. And I bought a car that was uh, just arrived from California. Um, it's a 1965 Mark III, uh, which means it's got the advantage of 
uh, windscreen, uh, uh, that beautiful curved windscreen, uh, wind up side windows and a hood that's so much easier to put up than my previous one. When it, with my previous one when it rained you didn't know whether to put the hood up or just battle it out because it took so long you'd be soaked by the time you got it done. Anyway, I bought this at left hand drive of course from America. It was in poor condition, it was a dark reddish colour um, and I committed this car to uh, to friends of mine and made good friends uh, through the Lotus, doing work on the Lotus and uh, work on the on the on the Porsche, um, Jimmy Rogers and Jimmy and his crew set to, and we took the Austin Healey completely to bits, and I mean every screw, washer, nut, bolt, um, had everything shod blasted, which of course is very much in my line of business anyway. Put a new chassis leg on, lined it all up, and then bought all the equipment from the specialist in, in, uh, in Scarborough and we built it up and the car I would say is as good if not better than new now. Um, the engine's been slightly improved, nothing very much but nice exhaust manifold and system on it and the cylinder head's been cleaned up but other than that effectively we had no new body panels to put on it, they were all serviceable and they were stripped down to bare metal and re repainted and um, the engine was sent away and rebuilt um, and gearbox uh, and back axle similarly checked out. Um, we put new, new custom, we had to put change it to right hand drives, so that meant new steering box, steering arms, and a new dashboard. Um, uh, but nevertheless, that's, it's all bolt on stuff. There was no real welding other than the chassis leg. Uh, and eventually, that car um, has, was finished uh, two years ago. And uh, I, so it's a 1965 car. I've been using it ever since and uh, we had it painted um, a very bright shade of red. It's a BMW colour I believe. I just chose it from a, from a book of colours. Uh, I think originally the car may have even been an apple green colour uh, before it, the, in America they'd, they'd painted it. Uh, I found a little thing in the door pocket of the car which had the name and address. It was like a little taxation, car tax thing from uh, the Americans and the people in California owned it and I had high hopes, I sent it off to them and I had high hopes that I might hear back from them. I was sending, going to send them the photographs of the car down. Sadly, they never got back in touch with me. So that's a different story. So the Austin Healey is on the bottle every time and it sits there and I, I love that car. Which brings us on to, in terms of years, into 1967, the Porsche 911. Um, I've already outlined my getting the car and already outlined the work that I had done to it and the number of rallies I did with it. Uh, we reached a stage where the rallies were becoming tougher. I was competing in, in the classic car road rally section, um, uh, but over, over the time and to make it more competitive, they were venturing more and more into forests and more and more into these army bases. And to be honest with you, the car was getting banged about. And good old Gary Tingley, who still looked after the car and still looks after it now really for me down, he's in Bedfordshire. We had a long discussion with, uh, at, at a certain stage when I'd partly ripped the door off and, uh, and done some damage under, underneath the car. And we decided that probably both the car and me had come to the point where we should probably call it a day as far as any of that more rallying is done. Um, and so what we did then, Gary stripped it down completely. I've got a full record of that. Uh, right down to bare body shell. We repaired it, we put new wings on it, we put various other things on it. We've uh, kept the engine and gearbox as modified by Andy Prill. That's still in the car. Um, we put uh, some later wheels on it, the Fouche um, five, uh, six inch wide wheels. Um, and we've had it retrimmed inside to represent the car that it was. The seats are actually more modern, but they're, they're reupholstered in exactly the way that the original seats were. And the car now, we've still got lights on the front of it, but we've taken off all the under shields. We've taken off out the roll cage and stuff like this. Um, and now it's a really thoroughly nice road car. Um, it's my favorite car by far because it's given me so many hours of enjoyment and competition and friendship. Navigator, I met a wonderful young man 
Um, and friends of mine were navigating for me and I thought it was a great success if we finished the right side of the river or in the right county. I didn't have any success at all really in terms of, of uh, awards uh, until I was asked to uh, su su suggest that I, I, I contact a young man who, were, who, who I went for and I met uh, uh, was on crutches. Uh, he'd uh, been in, in a car accident and uh, but however I, I asked him would he like to rally uh, navigate for me on a on a, a car rally that was coming up and he, he said he would. He'd rallied, navigated for his dad and one or two people, but he'd never navigated in a Porsche 911. And we formed a wonderful friendship. He's the same age as my daughter, Paul, and a very nice young man. He's got a very senior position with a uh, top uh, rally company now, um, and I don't see him now, but nevertheless, and so Paul and I then embarked on a program of rallies, including the Jogs, where I, I always knew we were on the right road. Um, and off the way for and uh, so we won some awards with that car and it, that was so, that, that the car deserved that and I probably did for my persistence so that car fully rebuilt as a road car is back in my collection now um, it gets run regularly if somebody said to me now would you like to go up to Inverness with that car and pick something up and back yeah, I wouldn't hesitate that car wouldn't wouldn't even cough or splutter on the way there or back um, the car is actually destined for my son um, on the basis that I want him to actually, he, he does a little bit of racing, in the, uh, but uh, not seriously, but um, I want him to use it and put it back in, in, into competition form and I'd like to see him use it to, to, to try and uh, do some well in either racing or rallying it, but that'll come in good time. So that's my favourite car and uh, that's uh, probably the pride of my collection. So we come to the final car in my collection. Uh, uh, this is a 1983 uh, Porsche 911 SC uh, Sport Targa. Um, I never went looking for it. I bought it seven years ago. I didn't go looking for this car. This car came looking for me. Uh, where I lived previous to where I live now, um, in a, a, an apartment in a large country house, there was a tea room just by the way, and I used to go there often for my breakfast. Uh, very often for the breakfast. And I used to meet a bunch of characters in there who used to go golfing. There's four lads together and over time I became to know them. And one of them one day leaned over and said, well Pete, you know a bit about cars, don't you? And I said, I did. And he said, only the friend, the lad that we play golf with is moving house um, and he needs to clear a couple of cars out of his garage. And one of them was a porch. I said, do you mean a Porsche? And he said, yeah, yeah, that's what I said. Oh, okay, then. Uh, what sort of Porsche, Porsche is it? And he said, I don't know, but he's had it a long time and uh, he, he hasn't used it and needs to go. So I said, okay, well, you know, <laughs> he gave me a telephone number and I rang this guy. And this chap turned out to be a retired police inspector, I think chief, chief inspector really. Um, he, his wife worked for the Crime Prosecution Service and they lived very well in this beautiful house in a village quite near where I live here, a place called South Cave. And they'd bought a big house and investment and uh, uh, later on and they were going to move house there. Um, the inspector tells me that he'd made a lot of money during the miners' strike and uh, where he'd been posted up to the northeast. And the police, they were get betting paid about 12 hours a day, seven days a week with uh, um, all expenses paid and the very best of accommodation, etc., and overtime rates and things. Anyway, it appears that he gathered enough money that he thought he'd surprise his wife and buy a nice car for them to have a run out in now and again. And so he bought this, this Porsche uh, and uh, his wife didn't like it. And so although he ran it for a little while, uh, he eventually wheeled it into the back of the garage and that's where it had sat for, for, for 14 years. Um, without turning a wheel. So I went down and he'd wheeled it out uh, for me to have a look at. It's a very, uh, very uh, becoming uh, dark metallic green, the original colour, very unusual, but it's its original Porsche colour. It looked generally in all right condition. He, 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 he thought it was worth a lot more than I thought it was. And he thought if he started the engine up, that would persuade me to raise my price. But when he started it up, we couldn't see anything for about 10 minutes because of the smoke coming out of it. Because every rubber seal in the engine and things had perished, of course. Anyway, we came to an arrangement on the price and um, I got my friend again with his transporter to bring the car back. Um, 
I didn't know what to make of it really at the time, but I thought, well, let's, let's, let's uh, see what we can do with it. Um, being a targa, it means that, as you know, you, you can take, lift the centre section of the roof out, which, which leaves you with the windscreen on one side and the back window on the other. So you actually don't get any buffeting at all when that roof panel's out. It folds up like an accordion and it, uh, uh, the panel like, uh, you know, and, and s stores away in the boot. So it's actually quite a, quite a nice car to drive around in. Um, and the more time I spent with it, the more I became to, to like it. Uh, and eventually I decided to spend uh, a bit of money on the car. So I had it repainted, the, I had new suspension put on it because it was all worn, all the bushes and the suspension were knackered. And uh, the engine I had rebuilt again by my friend uh, Jeremy and um, who put it all back together again. And uh, I, we've used this car um, extensively for trips around the country. Um, I, I last year went on a trip around Northumberland, the borders up into Scotland as far as Edinburgh, came down the other coast. It's a car that it's a powerful car, so it's three litre. Um, it's quick, it keeps up modern traffic without any problems at all. Um, it's comfortable to drive, it's comfortable inside. We've put a decent radio in it. Um, and all told, uh, it, it is, uh, it's, it's a nice car. Um, because it was a sport, it had a bloody great wing on the back, which looked like a, a tea tray, really. Um, I didn't like it, I'm not in favour of great wings on the back of Porsche, so I had that taken off. I had to get sent off to America for the bits to replace it with a plain engine lid and stuff like this, but I must prefer it like that. Uh, so I had, uh, and, and so that's a worthy car for my collection. So it's the last car in my collection. It's probably the most usable in real terms, but nevertheless, um, there is one space left in the garage, um, but I haven't any thoughts on adding another car to my collection as this. But every one of those cars, when I look back at them, uh, make me smile because of what they represented times in my life. And, uh, and so I thought I'd uh, get Robert to make a, a little presentation about them. It's for myself, but I'm, I'm sure I'll be showing my friends them um, to give me good memories and uh, put it on the film. That's it.